Welcome everybody to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, to our wonderful concert hall, Milton Court, and to the Electronic Music Department, who are hosting this masterclass today. My name is Mike Roberts, I'm the Head of Electronic Music, and it really is my pleasure to welcome you all here for our Logic Pro 10 masterclass. Running the masterclass this afternoon is Johnny Buchanan. He's one of our long-standing professors, and he combines being one of the finest teachers that I know with a busy and successful career as a composer, producer, music technology journalist, and all-round creative genius. So we're going to have a wonderful and fantastic afternoon, I believe, as we watch Jono follow his production workflow from beginning to end using Logic Pro 10. So please join me in giving him a really warm welcome to the stage, Jono Buchanan. Hello. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everybody. Well, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you so much. I just want to echo Mike. Uh, by welcoming you on, uh, into Milton Court this afternoon for what we hope is going to be a really exciting afternoon. It pains me to say it, but it's actually been 20 years since I first walked into the electronic music department across the street, despite my youthful looks. And what was remarkable about that very first uh, trip into uh, the electronic music department was that it was the first time I'd ever seen a group of musicians using a software program that I'd never seen before up to that point. Lots of people all sitting there with headphones on, working away, in what at that time was a software program called Logic Audio. Now, the computers that we had in electronic music at that time allowed only for a single mono audio track to be recorded at once. And it's extraordinary just to take a moment to think about the incredible developments that have taken place in the recording environments and in digital uh, recording and music in the intervening uh, 20 years. And the whole point of this afternoon is to really take you through some of Logic's workflow in terms of being able for you then to go and apply the creativity that we're going to look at to your own projects. So what we've got to start with today is a hopefully promising sort of song start, something really basic and simple, which we're going to take on through some recordings this afternoon to see how we can work with editing and production and mixing and mastering skills, which hopefully, as I say, you'll then be able to apply to your own pieces. And in particular, we're focusing on recording. As you can probably see behind me, we've got drums and guitars and vocals ready to add to this project. And we're going to get to those in due course. But just before we start, I'm really aware of the fact that in this room there are going to be some people who are brand new to Logic. In fact, maybe GarageBand users who are thinking about making the step up. There are going to be some intermediate uh, users, some people who know their way around, but maybe there are bits of the program they've never seen before. And there are going to be the ninjas, the people who could just as easily be up here doing this masterclass, who know Logic like the back of their hand. The idea of this afternoon is that we're trying to bring you some content regardless of the level that you're at. And I think even for the people who feel they know Logic really well, we're going to be looking at some things that maybe you haven't had a chance to check out before. So without further ado, let's get going. Just to make sure everyone's awake, we're actually going to start with some really basic MIDI programming tips, particularly for the people who have maybe never seen Logic before, but also just to show you some things that maybe you haven't come across in terms of workflow in particular. So here is my project start, which you can see on the screen behind you. It looks like loads of projects that haven't really had a chance to develop yet. We've got just five things uh, in the project already. And you can see that at the very top of the arrangement, I've mapped this out with uh, verse, bridge, and chorus um, uh, tags added in the arrangement bar so that we can see where we are in the song. I should, in fact, have said, this is a song project. So let's just hear what we've got so far. And I don't think this is going to be too intimidating. This is probably going to sound like a lot of the projects that you have got sitting on your hard drives on your computers back home. Thanks so much for coming. 
No, OK. So um, hopefully, this isn't too intimidating. As you can hear, we've just got a few little rhythmic elements. We've got a basic piano part that's underpinning the sort of harmonic structure of the piece. And we've got the sub bass part, which is just sitting underneath everything else, just propping it all up. So as I said, what we're going to do is to start with just with some really basic little um, MIDI uh, programming techniques, just to make this arrangement a little bit more fleshed out than it is right now. Now, you can see at the top of Logic Pro, I've got obviously this pointer tool, which is my main tool. And next to it, I've got what's called the command tool. This is a tool that's available to me if I hold down the command button. And what I'm going to start by doing is just lassoing the first two bars of this project, like this, using marquee. And then I'm going to go back to the pointer tool and click here. This is a really easy way of me being able to just produce a little cut at this point. Logic's asking me what I want to do with the notes that bridge bars five into six. I want to shorten them, so I'm going to press OK. And then what I can do is to copy these back to here. So what I've done there is just to create a slightly more interesting introduction than just jumping straight into the uh, beginning of the verse. And this, hopefully, is going to help the musicians have something more interesting than just a click track to listen to when we get round to making recordings. However, we could go a bit further than just copying the first two bars of the verse. So the next thing I'm going to do is to select this piano part. I'm going to control click it, and I'm going to bounce it in place. Now, what this means is that I'm going to turn this MIDI region into an audio file. MIDI is great. Whenever we've got keyboards plugged in, and we want to make real-time recordings, and we want to start building an arrangement in a musical way, that's what we need MIDI for. And it's an amazingly powerful and flexible language. But there are some things we can only do when we're working with audio files. And the thing that I've got in mind for this particular piano part is exactly that. It's an audio-only process. So I'm going to call this piano reversed, and I'm going to bounce that down. Now, what has happened now is that Logic has created a perfect copy of this MIDI file, but now it's an audio file. And if I open up the editor on this particular window, and I come into the file area here, I can see the waveform display for this new piano note. And within the functions menu, there are a whole range of things I can do to this file, including reversing it. And if we come back out of the editor, we'll see very clearly on the screen that we've now got the original piano note as MIDI, followed by the reversed version as audio. And if we run those two, we'll hear them like this. So that's helping me just have a little bit of shape coming out of this introductory um, area into the verse. And again, I think that's going to help the musicians know where they are within the project. Now, the next thing I've got, as you can see on some of the empty tracks underneath the project where we are right now, is I've got some sounds which I liked at the uh, writing stage, which I haven't had a chance to develop into parts of their own just yet. And in particular, what I've got is a, a second synth bass part. And the reason why this is here is because the sub bass is providing an enormous amount of weight and body to the track, but it's not actually giving me much harmonic content. Sub basses are fantastic. They're popular in lots and lots of different forms of music, and they're great at giving us the weight. That's the thing that's kind of making your chest rattle a little bit. But they don't connect to the rest of tracks very easily unless you're careful. They kind of sit there at the bottom being a bit murky. And what I want to do is to add a secondary bass sort of between the sub and the rest of the track in order to sort of glue these elements of the production together. So what I'm going to do is to simply copy this part down to the track underneath. And if we solo these two, I think we'll hear the difference between the two sounds. The sub is that low, big, rich sound I was talking about before, whereas the second synth bass is just going to provide a little bit of bite at the start of the note. OK, so you can hear that biting, and then the sub kind of takes over and fills in the hole underneath. OK, so layering sounds, pretty straightforward. But what I might want to do now is to sort of develop this second bass line in order to make it a slightly more interesting experience than just having it play the sustained notes that the first part is. And in particular, I'm going to focus now on this area here, which is the bridge. This is the point where I want the song to develop a little bit more momentum than it has right now. So I'm going to, again, open the editor for this particular part. And very easily, I'm going to just select both of these notes and drag them back so they're super short. Now, every time we click on a note, you can hear it. It's coming through uh, the PA system. And you can uh, hear it being triggered every time I, trick, uh, I um, click on it. So what I'm going to do is just to turn off the MIDI output routing there for a moment so I can carry on talking while we make this edit. Now, what I want to do is to have this note repeat in eighth notes. So what I'm going to do is to select eighth note as my quantized value within this window. And instantly, that's now going to create new eighth notes for me. Now, I could copy and paste all these notes one after another in order to create the rhythm that I'm after. But there is a dedicated tool which is going to allow me to do that, which is called the brush tool. 
And what the brush tool lets me do is to drag across a whole range of notes, creating at that interval the notes that I want, just like this. But it's very easy for me to slightly lose my way and end up with some notes that really I don't want. So what I'm going to do is to refine the view a little bit here, undo that step and go back one step, and I'm going to use what's called collapse mode. Now, what this does is to only show me the notes that are already present within this little part of MIDI. And as a result, it's now much harder for me to make an error. I can drag across here very quickly and fill in this gap, and I can do the same thing with the note below. And then if I want to add more notes or different pitches to this MIDI region at a later date, I can just come back out of collapse mode, and I've got the full um, uh, range of pitches available to me uh, ready to go. So now what we should have, if I come back out of here, is a slightly more interesting, more biting part running through the arrangement uh, through the bridge. And sure enough, we do. Now, let's just look at the editor again for a moment. You'll have seen that, of course, in uh, brush mode and working in this way, all of the values assigned to these MIDI regions are exactly the same. The reason that all these notes are green is because they all have the same velocity data. Now, I could open up the velocity tool and start dragging individual notes around in order to make that change. But what I'm more interested to do is to carry out a function using MIDI transform. Now, what MIDI Transform allows me to do is to take a region like this, come into the Functions menu, and from here, I can choose a whole range of potential processes which will allow me to do interesting things with MIDI which might benefit my project. And in particular, what I want to do is to open up Random Velocity. The moment I click on this, I can now begin to manipulate exactly what I want these random velocities to be. Of course, I want them to be random, but I can uh, control just how random they're going to be. All of those velocities as they started uh, life a moment ago were, I think, at about sort of 60 uh, as a value. So what I could do would be to increase the upper limit, drop the lower little, uh, limit a little bit, and then hit select and operate. And what that does is to instantly bring a more randomized approach to velocity. And if you haven't come across the MIDI transform window, it's amazingly powerful. It's great for making things double speed or half speed or processing MIDI in a whole range of different ways and really worth checking out. So let's come out of solo mode for a moment. There's one more part that I want to build from the pieces that are already within this project. I'm going to take this sub bass part and I'm going to copy it down to another little synth that I've got lined up here. Now, so far, all we're really doing is just copying one part onto another and that's adding richness and power to the arrangement, but it's not necessarily allowing us to get away from the sort of original pitches that we started um, the project with. So what I'm then going to do is to open up the inspector, which brings me this window on, over on the left-hand side where I can make changes to specific parameters over MIDI as well. So up here, I've got a little uh, region tab, and if I open this up, this allows me to choose some choice parameters for here, and what I want to do is very quickly just add a transposition value to this second part, which is gonna take this part up an octave. Let's just hear how the synths now sound with eighths assigned um, across the board um, in the chorus section of the song. Okay, that's great, but all of these sounds are really static. At the moment, they're all consistent, they're not changing, and whilst they're adding lots of power, we haven't actually got any sort of animation going on within this um, part at the moment. Now, this allows me to introduce uh, automation mode, the idea of being able to add parameter-based data to a specific region. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that this particular part is being triggered from an instrument called RetroSynth, and if I open that up, you can see it very clearly here. What I want to do is to take a specific parameter within this synthesizer and have it change as the part plays back. In particular, it's tone. I really want that to bite and go from being quite dull, as it is right now, to being much brighter. So as we work through the chorus, we're in a position to hear that um, being added. So what I'm going to do is just make sure you can see this underneath, and we're going to go into automation mode. And what that's going to allow me to do is to record a parameter to this region as we go. Now, there are multiple automation modes, and in order to write new information, I'm going to select Latch Mode. And what that lets me do is to pick up any parameter on the screen and write a data line for it. Let's see how that works.
So the parameter that I've chosen here is the envelope, which is triggering the filter, the amount of bytes we're hearing at the beginning of the note. And as a result, sometimes we get a bit more byte, and the rest of the time, we get a bit less. And as a result, I get this nice line showing me those changes to tone as the part plays back. Now, once you've recorded an automation parameter, it's worth bearing in mind that what you probably want to do at this stage is to protect it. In other words, you want it to play back but you don't want to inadvertently add new lines of data that you didn't really mean to. If I'm not careful and I suddenly decide that I want to adjust the volume of this part, it would be very easy for me to then add a volume automation data line to this part, which isn't really what I want at this stage. So what I'm going to do is to switch my mode back to read, and what that does is to play back the data that already exists, but it doesn't allow me to add more to um, this particular region. I'd go back to latch mode if I wanted to do that. So what we've done now, and you'll notice there's no keyboard on stage, we have fleshed out the arrangement a little bit more. So it's just a little bit fuller, a little bit richer, but we haven't actually had to record anything new in order for that to take place. So hopefully now we're all wide awake and we've had a chance to look at some basic uh, MIDI programming just in order to make um, the arrangement a little bit fuller for when our musicians take to the stage. And I think it's high time we brought out the first of those right now. It would be my great uh, pleasure to introduce Tom Hutchison, a graduate of last year's jazz course here at the Guildhall School, to come and play some drums for us. Please give Tom a big round of applause. <laughs> Hello, Tom. I think you got a longer round of applause than I did. I need to be a graduate of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. That's the only fair thing, I think. OK, so Tom's going to come and play some drums for us. And um, we're going to do that in due course. But now that Tom's actually on stage, we've got a chance really to explore this rig that we've set up for today. Because so far, everything I've done has only really required the central piece of my arrangement here, my technology here uh, for today's workshop. And that is a 15-inch MacBook Pro. Everything we are doing today is going into this machine. There are no external hard drives. The audio we're going to record is going onto this machine. There's nothing hiding anywhere else. This is the entire rig, OK? What Tom's got surrounding his drum kit, as you would expect, is a whole series of microphones. Now, no computer has microphone inputs. What we need is a bridge between the microphones that we want to record and the computer to which we're recording them. And for those, for that process to happen, we need what are called audio interfaces. And we're working with two today. We're working with two interfaces from Apogee. And to show you exactly how the rig is put together, let's just have a quick look um, at how uh, our system is built. So as I said, we've got a MacBook Pro sitting at the heart of our rig. And connected to that, we've got two Apogee interfaces. We've got an Element 88, and we've got the Apogee Ensemble interface. Now, the Apogee 88 contains eight inputs and eight outputs, and the Ensemble contains eight analog inputs and outputs as well, as well as myriad digital options. If we wanted to make digital recordings, we could take those into the Ensemble as well. In fact, I calculated earlier on that we've got 56 channels of input and output connected to this MacBook Pro. Now, before you think, well, that's overkill, when would you ever need that number of channels? Imagine that what we were doing up here was recording an orchestra rather than a drum kit and a guitarist and a singer. Then, as well as the hall mics to pick up the room, we might need spot mics on every desk of the orchestra, and very quickly, you could easily assign that number of channels, and of course, we could record those into the MacBook Pro very easily. It's a Thunderbolt connection that connects the Apogee interfaces into the computer, and what we've then done, of course, around Tom's rig, is to put up our microphones. So we're actually using nine microphone feeds from his computer. We've got one on the kick, which is the AKG D12. It's a dynamic microphone specifically engineered for recording uh, kick drums. We've got two mics on the snare. The one on the top is the Shaw SM57, and I've got an AKG414 underneath. Then we've got Sennheiser E904s on the toms. Now, these are great clip-on mics Hopefully, Tom's not going to hit one. In fact, they're designed almost to sort of stay out of the way, which is a serious consideration when you're micing up a drum kit and worth bearing in mind if you're going to go home and do that tomorrow. Then we've got our overheads, which are, again, um, AKG C414s. Now, the overheads are a really, really important part of a drum kit sound. Whenever you're working in a studio or in an environment that's geared towards drum kit recording, the overheads are really going to give you the character. They're going to pick up the space in which you're recording. And whilst we're in by no means a recording studio here, it's the 414s that I'm kind of most excited about because they're picking up the sound of the hall the most. And then lastly, we've got another SM57 on Tom's hats. So 
How does all that work? Well, every single uh, microphone is coming across in a separate cable into its own dedicated input on, the, uh, on one of the Apogee interfaces so that we're ready to make a recording. So if we switch back to Logic for a moment, what we can do in order to get ready for audio recording is simply to click the plus button here at the top, which launches the new track list. And if I was making a multi-track recording as I'm intending to with Tom right now, I could select audio, I could then choose the number of microphones that I wanted, which would be nine. And run, one really nice feature is that I can select input number one as the first input, and then I can click the ascending button. And what that will do is to go through and assign the next input number to each new track. So input two would be on track two, and so on and so forth. So that makes life really easy. But I wanted today to make sure that our tracks were named so you can see them going down, the recordings were all ready to go. So actually, we've got some drum tracks already set up and ready to go. And uh, they're down here at the bottom. So you can see straight away that from the kick all the way down to the hat, we are um, set up for audio recording across this group of tracks here. Now, in a moment, what I'm going to do is to set, uh, check that the levels coming from Tom's kit are as we need them to be and I'm going to arm these tracks and get ready for recording. But we need to be careful, and the reason why we need to be careful is this is genuinely a live recording session, which means that these mics are on, and the PA system's on as well, and if we're not careful, the sound triggered from Logic is gonna come out of the PA system, go into Tom's mics, come through the computer, and go back to the PA system, we're gonna end up with a feedback loop. And even if I don't deafen you with howling feedback, there is just a chance, of course, that the backing track that I want Tom to record to is going to be picked up and go into his microphones. And that's the last thing I want. There's no way that I can prevent that or get rid of it at a later date. So what I am gonna do is to turn the volume back down, just so while we're recording, we don't run the risk of any spill. So what I'm gonna ask Tom to do now is just to play anything. We're gonna arm these tracks, make sure they're all making a noise, and then we'll begin to think about the part that we want to record for the song. So Tom, take it away. So he doesn't want to stop. Who can blame him? OK, so we've got our tracks all armed and ready to go. And you can see the record lights at the bottom showing us the input levels. Now, you might notice that I don't actually need to go to the audio interfaces in order to make adjustments to any of the mic preamps that we're using. You can see that up here at the top of the mixer, I can actually do that within Logic. The condenser microphones, which we're using, the overheads and the one underneath the snare, require 48 volts of phantom power, and that's switched on. You can also see that I've got individual gain dials for each channel. So if I wanted to make an adjustment to any levels, I'd be able to do that directly inside Logic, rather than having to reconfigure that outside in another piece of software. So the levels look pretty good to me. So I think what we'll do is we'll go for a take. I'm going to come back out of the mixer and take the song project back to the beginning. I've obviously built this new introduction into the beginning of the track, so Tom's got two bars of musical count in. And what I'm going to do is just move the ruler to the beginning of that. Now, when I press record, it's going to jump back a bar and give us an empty bar. So, Tom, you're going to get one bar of click, and then you're going to get two bars of intro. The levels are off in the room, so with any luck, we're um, going to just uh, have an opportunity to see this recording going down in real time. Here we go. Okay, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Tom. We'll see you later on. OK, now the reason that I didn't want you to applaud too soon was because it's really easy when you're making recordings just to get a little bit excited and press stop too soon. And the last thing that Tom played for us was a lovely great crash cymbal on the outro, which of course we want all of that resonance to ring on naturally and go all the way through to the end. And it's really easy when you're recording any instrument just to press stop and suddenly think, oh, there's no way back. So I was really keen for us to have that sort of natural decay coming through the recording. So in order to make sure that we don't end up howling feedback at this stage, I'm going to take all of these back out of record mode and we can turn the volume back up and we can begin to hear the performance that Tom recorded for us. Let's go back to the top and just have a listen. that decay I was talking about. So we've got this great collection of drum tracks now. However, there are a couple of things that I'd really like to edit about them. So before we start thinking about making them blend within the project sonically, we need to think a little bit carefully about how we might just tighten up the timing in a couple of spots. Now here I've got multiple audio tracks all sitting on top of one another. And what I really want to do is to find a way where I can kind of treat them as one. If I make a change to one audio file, I want that to pass all the way down through the other tracks so that I don't have to be constantly selecting multiple tracks at once. So I'm going to come into the mixer, and what I'm going to do for these drum tracks is to set up what's called a group. And that's available here, just above the automation window where we were before. I can click here and select group number one. Now, if I go back into this window for a second and open up the group settings, we have a chance to configure this group and make it make sense in the context of our piece. So the first thing I'm going to do is to name it drums. And what I'm going to do is to make sure that the group is active, make sure it's actually making a noise and, and, and behaving itself. And in addition to that, what I want to do is to make sure that I've selected what I want this group to be for. And in particular, I want to make sure that I can edit with it. And what that means now is that if I select one of these audio tracks, the others will all fall into line and sort of behave alongside the first one. So let's come back out of the mixer for a moment and go back to where we were a second ago. So as I said, there are a couple of spots within this performance where the timing could be a little bit tighter. There's actually kind of an error right at the beginning. Shh, don't tell Tom. But there are also some other bits later on which I think we could uh, tighten up. Um, so let's just have a look at how we might go about doing that. In order to see where I'm talking about, let's go back to the uh, very beginning of the project and just have a listen to the first couple of bars that Tom recorded and we'll see if we can spot this little timing error. Okay, so we've got this little interesting musical skip. Now, I kind of want this stompy four to the floor feel the whole way through the introduction, so I want to move this particular note. Now, in the bad old days, what that would mean would, I, would be that I'd have to go and grab the scissors, chop this file, try and find the start of it, move it back, try and then chop after it so as not to affect everything that came afterwards. And one way or another, it would be a little bit of a nightmare trying to get this thing to go in time. It was possible, but it would take quite a long time. What I can do now is to ask Logic to help me out with that by going into what's called flex mode. And if I click this button here, what I can do is to open up flex editing, which allows me to treat audio files elastically in terms of their time. Now, what I mean by that is that obviously when I press record and when I then press stop at the end, any audio file is of a fixed length. It obviously has a start point and an end point. But along the line, as that audio recording goes down, all of these individual little moments happen. We call those transients. You can see them on the screen here very clearly on the kick drum. And what flex mode allows me to do is to detect those and move them around. Let me show you exactly what I mean. I'm going to select a mode here that's perfect for exactly what I'm intending to do, which is called slicing mode. 
And the moment I select that, Logic's now having a think. It's going through these multiple audio streams, which are grouped together, remember, and it's slicing up this file so that it's detected those uh, individual moments so that I'm in a position to start editing them. And you can see that when that process is finished, I get a display that looks like this. The waveform's grayed out a little bit. It's gone a bit darker. And I can see all these little white lines which are sitting there ready for me to manipulate these and move them around in time. Now, as I said, the problem we've got is sort of here, the second hit in uh, bar three. Let's just hear it again. So what I want to do is to make sure that this one doesn't move. So I'm going to click here. What I also want to do is to make sure that this one doesn't move. So I'm also going to click here. And then I can select the problem hit and simply drag it back to bar two, or back to beat two, I should say. And what that's done is to cascade through all of the audio files that we've recorded. And hopefully, that's corrected that moment of timing. So now that kick drum's in time. Now we don't have to tell Tom that he made an error because it's gone. OK, so that's great. But we've also got some spots later on where the timing could be a little bit tighter. And now that I've actually sort of flex edited this drum part, I'm in a position to manipulate those as well. Now, this, again, I could go through and do manually. I could find the spots that I want to move, and I could drag them around. But now that we've got these little transient marker detection points within the audio files, I can actually quantize this audio as well. So this is obviously uh, quantize is a technique that we more readily associate with MIDI, the idea that we can take individual bits of data and have them changed in this way. But because effectively all of these transient markers represent points in the timeline, we can ask Logic to move them en masse. So I can select 1 over 16, and hopefully some of the other timing errors further on in the project have also been corrected. Let's take a listen. OK, sounds pretty in time to me. Now, this brings up our first kind of moral musical dilemma of the afternoon. Is it my right to take Tom's years of drumming experience? I can't play the drums. So the fact that Tom's come down and played for us is uh, a real boon for me. I need to think carefully about whether or not I need to bear in mind that just making him sound like a drum machine isn't necessarily the most musical decision I could make. Yeah, the timing wasn't quite as tight as I'd like it to be, but I also don't want him to simply sound like any old drummer who's just been put in time, with every single hit that he's played moved absolutely in time. So do I only have a binary choice here? Do I have to decide whether or not I want no flex editing, no quantize at all, or this 100% uh, sort of super quantize feel? Well, fortunately not. Down here at the bottom, I've got a quantize strength option. And what this allows me to do if I turn it down is to move Tom some of the way between where he played each hit and perfect timing, which allows me to retain some of the feel of what he played at the same time as tightening timing sufficiently. And I'm going to leave this at about 80% so that I've kept some of the feel of Tom's performance in the track. So we've now looked at flex editing for the first time this afternoon. We're going to see it again later on. But what we've done here with flex editing is to just tighten up the timing of this performance. And I'm finished with that now, so I'm going to come out of flex mode. So we've now made an edit from a timing point of view. But what I want to do now is to start thinking about the sound of the drums. We've got all of the raw data that's come through from those microphone channels, and they're sounding pretty good. But what I want to do now is to have control over the entire drum kit as if it were kind of one instrument, which it sort of is. So the next thing I'm going to do is to select all of these tracks, and I'm going to create what's called a track stack. I'm just control clicking any of these regions, and now I can select track stack here. Now, this little window pops down at the top asking me what sort of a track stack I want to create. Do I want a folder stack? 
Now, what this means is I'm going to end up with a fader, a channel which is controlling all of the drums that are assigned to this particular stack. And a folder stack doesn't give me much more control than having a volume control. Useful, but not quite as much control as I would like. What I'm going to do instead is to select a summing stack, which is here. I'm going to create this option. And what this does is to give me a new auxiliary channel to which all of these drums are now routed. Rather than going straight from the mixer to the stereo output, what's happening now is they're being routed into an auxiliary where I can do stuff to them, which is going to be incredibly helpful. However, what I need to do first of all is to name this. And actually, what I'm also going to do is just change the icon here as well, because I want to remember that these are drums. This is my drum stack. Now, the first thing that happens is that this makes my life much easier in the Arrange page, because if I close this down, I can now see that my entire drum part has been allocated to this stack. This part here is now controlling the entire drum sound, which means if I, I can turn it up and down using this fader, and that will affect all of the volumes of all of those individual parts together. But I don't just want to turn them all up and down. I want to think a little bit more carefully about how I might process the drum sound overall. And this gives us a chance to introduce the concept of compression, which is the first of the uh, plugins that we're going to really look at in depth this afternoon. The idea of being able to put a compressor on a sound and what it means to do that. So let's just put it here, front and center. So what do compressors do? Why do we use them in audio recording and in mixing? and even in mastering as well, why are compressors so important? Well, to understand the answer to that question, we really need to understand what we talk about when we talk about dynamic range, the idea of what volume is. So whenever we make recordings, <clears throat> what we have are the quietest moments, the bits in between all of those drum hits, where effectively the sound has a chance to recover to near silence, or indeed silence, right at the end. And we also have the really loud bits. We have the bits where Tom's hitting his drums hard, and those are producing the spikes and the peaks that we're looking at. And everything in between, between the quietest moments and the loudest moments, what we call that dynamic range. And dynamic range is really important in music. If you're a film composer and you suddenly ask your string section to play quietly, you want them to play quietly. If you want them to play super loud, you indicate that on the score. It's massively important that we have dynamics in music. But what compressors allow us to do is to mess around with dynamic range and rein it in. In other words, to take the distance between the quietest moments and the loudest moments and pull them closer together so that we get a more controlled, punchier sound. Now, I'm starting to use the sorts of adjectives that you will hear or read if ever you really look into working with compressors. You'll hear people using phrases like they inflate sound or they make it harder or they make it pump more. But interestingly, Actually, that's not really what compressors do at all. Until the very last stage of working with compression, what compressors actually do is to make things quieter. I'll explain what I mean. What I'm going to do here is to turn off the auto gain, the automatic gain compensation within Logic's compressor so that it's off. It's now not doing anything. And what we can then do is to start to explore some of the other parameters within compression and understand how volume is reined in or pulled back when we work in this way. The first parameter we're going to look at is threshold. Now, what threshold does is to set a point somewhere in the dynamic range, and it basically says, at this point, this compressor, I am going to start applying dynamic uh, range reduction. In other words, above this point, somewhere in the middle, I'm going to start pulling down the volume of the loudest moments above that. Hence, downward compression, this idea that we can actually rain peaks down a bit. Now, how hard do we want to make the compressor work? Do we want it to take those peaks down a little bit or an awful lot? Well, that's controlled by the ratio amount. So these two dials are really important. If I turn ratio up, what that basically means is above the threshold point, the amount of additional volume we get is less. Whereas if I make ratio much more natural and uh, we set a smaller value here, the sound is allowed to get almost as loud as it did before it was compressed. Now, as I've said, what compressors do is to make sounds quieter. And we should be able to hear that. If I set a really low threshold here so that lots of the sound is being compressed, and if we turn the ratio up as well, then we should see the compressor working quite hard. And because we're not adding any automatic gain, we should hear, when I punch the compressor in and out, that the drums are being squashed, they're being flattened, and they're actually getting quieter. Let's just try that now. The drums are in solo mode. Let's just run them from the top of the verse. So this is with no compression at all.
Okay, so you can hear what I mean. What we've got now is the drums being squashed really hard. Now, the kind of sound they're producing, obviously it drops away in volume and that's kind of unimpressive, but the sound that's happening in those moments is squashed. You can hear that all of the individual drum components are being sort of melded together, squeezed really hard. And that's exactly what we want from compression. It's just that we don't really have it acting loudly enough now. Now, before we start compensating for that and turning things up, it's also worth bearing in mind that what we've got within Logic's compressor isn't one compressor at all. We've got lots of different modeled compression approaches. Since compression became a really important part of the recording process in the 1950s, all the way through to now, there are loads of manufacturers who have built incredible sounding hardware that takes a different approach to working with compression. And within Logic's compressor, we've got a, a number of those emulated or modeled here. So we've got different designs, which we can see really carefully here, but they all sound different as well because they're emulating the behavior of these compressors too. So what we're going to do in a minute is to hear those one after another working. But firstly, we're going to deal with this issue of volume. I've lost lots of volume as a result of my downward compression, but also I've told you that people refer to compressors as kind of inflators, things that make things bigger. And the reason for that is because of this dial here, makeup gain. What makeup gain allows you to do is to turn up the volume to compensate for the volume loss that you've had as a result of the compression process. There's a sentence for you. Okay? So I say that again. So makeup gain allows you to take the volume back up to restore the peaks to where they were in the first place. But because we've squeezed the dynamic range, as a result of doing that, we're obviously going to bring up the quieter moments of the performance as well. We flatten the dynamic range, and now we're turning everything back up again. And as a result, we get those words that we hear associated with compression, this idea of inflation or of sort of in some way enlarging the impression of the sound as we listen through it. So I'm going to run the drums again. And what I'm going to do is to, first of all, set a makeup gain level. But I'm also going to audition some of these other compressor models and begin to see how they sound uh, from one to the next. Okay, so you can see that I'm adjusting the makeup gain dial because what I don't want to do is to overload the output of this drum bus. So we pull this down. I might just take it down a little bit more. And actually, this uh, vintage Opto uh, model, I really like on drums. It gives this really uh, gluey sound. It really puts the gr uh, drums together and feels like they really belong together. But what I really have done here is to smash the drums to pieces. By dropping the threshold a lot and by turning the ratio up a lot, I've got this really unnatural sound. It doesn't really bear any relation to the nuance and the individual hits that Tom played when he first made a recording. What would be great is if I could blend that, that original set of recordings, with this um, uh, compression treatment so that I could set a balance between the natural dynamics of his performance with this super squashed effect. That's what we call a parallel treatment in production, having an original set of sounds running alongside a parallel processed version of them as well. Unfortunately, we've got a parallel process built directly into Logic's compressor right here on this mix dial down in the right-hand corner. What we're hearing now at the moment is exclusively the output, just the compressor. If I turn it around here, we hear just the input. This is just what Tom played without any processing at all. And what I think we're going to need is probably a balance somewhere in the middle, which gives me some of that compressed sound alongside the original part as well. Let's dial it in as we go, and I'm going to put it back in with the track, and we'll see if we can find a sort of sound solution that feels like it suits the drums really nicely. Let's run it from the top.
Okay, so that's working nicely for me. It's worth pointing out, by the way, I think at this stage, the one part of the rig that I didn't introduce to you is that I'm working here on a pair of Genelec AZ40s, and you guys have got the PA system. And it's fair to say, I think, that we're not hearing exactly the same mix as a result. So what I'm trying to do here is to make some critical choices that feel right to me up here, and obviously the PA system is giving you a slightly different sound. So let's just bear that in mind as well. So uh, it could be entirely that if you had control of the mix dial, you'd make different choices. But that also brings us on to a really important point as well. I get asked a lot in teaching and in journalism and in the various things that I do that use logic on a daily basis. Well, what is the right setting? What is the right parallel compression treatment for a, dr a set of drums when you're recording them for a project like this? Well, how specific does the question need to be before you realize that there is no answer to that question? The reason that we were born with ears was so that we could make really critical choices about how we want to process sounds. Everybody in this room, left to their own devices, would make different music. They'd set up different effect stems. They'd set up different approaches to processing sound in different ways. And that's why music making is something we still do and continue to feel creative about. We can't just say, well, you know what? Actually, yeah, 49% is exactly the right amount of parallel processing because there's no way for me to do that. We'd all make different choices. So be comfortable in those choices. Absolutely audition them. But when you find something you think works, go with it. OK, so what we've done here is we've set up a parallel compression process on these drums. And that's because we've got a track stack which is allowing us to process all the drums together. Now, that's great. But what I also want to do is to be in a position where I can start thinking about spatial treatments, reverbs in other words, not only for the whole drum kit, but also for specific pieces within the drum kit. So let's deal with the first one first. What I want to do is to add a, a kind of ambient style um, uh, reverb treatment to the whole drum kit. And I've got one here, small room, uh, which is going to give me, um, I think, some extra presence around the kit. Again, let's just solo that so you can hear this treatment being added to the entire drum part. Tell you what, let's run this over the bridge section so you can hear it going in. Okay, so we've got this little bit of focus around the sound. And in case you're thinking, I'm not really hearing that, what we can actually do within Logic, and it's really worth bearing this in mind, is we can actually solo just the reverb. What that means is I can really focus in on the sound that the drums are going into in order to customize it for my project. So what I've done here is just to solo the reverb return. And if I put that back in with the dry drums, isn't it amazing how much easier to, it is to hear the reverb now that you know what it sounds like without the drums? So we've now got a reverb treatment, an ambience treatment that's sitting on just the drum kit. But what I also want to do is to add a reverb to just the snares. Well, as we know, we've got a track stack. If I set up a reverb here, a longer reverb, which is what I've got in mind for the snares, then obviously that's going to affect everything. The kick drum, things are going to get, start getting really swampy, and that's not really what I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the stack back up here, and then I'm going to jump into the mixer, and what I can then do is to go and find the two snare channels, which are sitting here, snare top and snare bottom. I'm going to select both of these tracks, and then what I can do is to select a new auxiliary, and I can select long verb. Now, this is a long reverb treatment that, that um, I've set up for the project, and we're going to have plenty of that on the snare. And if I run over the end of the track, we should hear plenty of that additional reverb being added to the snares coming out of the chorus. Well, I don't know how that sounds out there, but on the Genelex, that sounds fantastic. We've got loads more power now in the snares. Now, crucially, it's not really being added, well, it's crucially not being added to the whole of the rest of the drum stem. We've just selected the snares. So just because I set up a track stack doesn't mean that I don't still have access to individual components within the drum kit. So I could come back into the snares, I could adjust compressors on them individually, I could EQ them individually, I can still go sound by sound, but the track stack allows me to set up treatments that affect the entire drum kit. So what we've now got is an edited drum part, which we've uh, corrected timing on, but we've also started thinking about from a sonic point of view. 
And actually, we've also spent quite a lot of time thinking about the rig that we're using today. And I think it would be a good idea now just to kind of summarize what we've looked at so far with regard to drum recording. So if we can switch across, that would be fantastic. And we'll have a quick look at uh, the techniques that we've looked at so far. So specifically with regard to drum recording, what we did first of all was to connect each microphone to its own input channel. Now obviously we did that before you arrived, otherwise you'd been waiting for ages. But for every single microphone we need a dedicated input on our audio interfaces. And what, uh, the reason why we're using two audio interfaces is because we needed more than the eight individual analog ins that one interface provided us with. So each microphone goes in to its own input channel. What we then did was to think about game change. At the top of uh, Logic's mixer, we had a chance to adjust the preamps for every single channel within the mixer. We didn't have to go out of Logic in order to do that. Now, this is a really crucial detail that I've put in the second point here as well. I see students doing this all the time, which is that they'll plug in a microphone, and in order to adjust the level on it, they'll reach for the mixer fader, and they'll pull it down. Now, what you're actually doing there is you're turning down the volume of the sound that's being recorded. So in other words, you're taking an overloaded signal and you're turning its volume down. So if you've got distortion in that channel as a result of the preamp level being too high, it will still be distorted if you turn the volume down, okay? So to control gain, don't touch the mixer faders. I didn't touch mine at all until we'd actually made those recordings. It's the preamps that you're recording through that control volume, not the mixer faders. Then what we did was to look at flex time for time-based editing. So we looked at two things there. We set up flex time, and uh, we started looking at timing correction changes, both by quantizing the entire part and also by finding one little error and pulling it in time by setting up those transient markers and moving those around so that we got what we wanted from them. But it's really important that you make musical decisions about quantizing audio. Remember, those musicians have practiced hard, and maybe their feel, rhythmically, is even better than yours. So try and preserve it whenever you possibly can. And then what we've done is we've consolidated multiple audio stacks into what we call a track stack. That's created an auxiliary where all of those drums are rooted so that we can make changes to their tone as one instrument. So we've still got individual control over the individual tracks, as we saw in the mixer, but we've also got a chance to set up compression, which we've looked at in depth now, and um, other effects which will affect the entire uh, drum channel. Okay. We're in good shape. We now have drums added to our project. I think it's time we now switch to guitars. So I'd like to welcome Marius onto the stage. He's going to come and play for us. <clears throat> hey, Marius. So if you're not a graduate of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, you don't get as big a round of applause. This is Marius, everybody. There you go, I did what I could for you. Okay, so Marius has come to play guitars for us. And unlike Tom, you will notice the first thing about that is that he is not surrounded by microphones. Now, of course, it's fair to say that loads of guitarists really like working with physical amplifiers and with microphones to match those. But it's also fair to say that for the rest of us who aren't guitarists, the sounds of those amplifiers and those microphones can get quite annoying. And what I mean by that is, let's suppose you live underneath Marius and he decides he's gonna plug in his Marshall stack at three in the morning because he's got a great idea for a song. Well, I don't wanna be Marius's neighbor, okay? Uh, so I'm sorry, I mean, I'd love to be your neighbor, but not under those circumstances. So what we're gonna do today is to configure an amp solution for Marius's guitar without actually having to put a microphone anywhere near an amplifier. And the reason that that's possible is because of Amp Designer, which is a plugin dedicated within Logic, which allows us to configure really carefully a sound that hopefully is going to suit uh, this particular project. So what I've got for Marius in terms of recording is we've got one line coming out of his guitar, which is plugged into a different audio interface uh, channel. So that's actually set up here. We can see it very uh, clearly. And if I go into input monitoring mode, with any luck, we've got some sound. Okay, so Marius, keep playing for us. This is the sound of Marius's guitar without me doing anything to it. We've got a gain control just to keep volume under control, but otherwise he sounds like this. Okay, so a completely dry, direct input. What I'm gonna do now is to fire up Amp Designer, 
which I can do by coming into the amps and pedals section here, and Amp Designer is waiting for me right here. And here is its interface, or at least here is one face of its interface. We'll come to that in a moment. So straight away now, in real time, Marius is able to play through this amp, and we can see that we've got a range of things that we can control as far as the amp's concerned. We've got an EQ stage, we've got inbuilt reverb, we've got other effects as well, we've got presence and mask dials, and we've got this section over here, which I'm going to come to in a moment. But just to give you a sense of some of the flavors that are available to us, within the presets in uh, Amp Designer, we can look at clean, crunched, and distorted sounds. And I'm going to just throw a couple at Marius just to see how he kind of responds to them. This one might be a nice place to start. OK, so straight away, what we can do is to hear this sound. OK, nice start. Then what we're going to do is maybe have a think about something uh, maybe a little bit more contemporary. Let's try this one. OK, let's have a look at one of the uh, crunchy amps as well. Let's try this. Thanks, Marius. Now, at the moment, what we're doing as we audition through these uh, choices is that we're matching amplifiers to cabinets. And what we're also doing is using this virtual microphone here to set a position, imagining that we actually have got a microphone in front of an actual amplifier or a cab here. So I can, of course, just flick through presets, and I can think about just auditioning things, and they're inspiring Marius to play different things. But also, what I can do is to create completely bespoke options as well. What I could do would be to come in here and choose a particular amplifier, like this one, or I could flick through some of the others, and you can hear them ready to go and uh, ready to sort of join in with um, uh, this recording that we're about to make. What I can also do is to either match those or deliberately set up custom uh, cabinet solutions. And what I can also do is to think about the microphones that I might want to use if I was actually uh, creating um, a real uh, recording situation. So I've got dynamic, condenser, and ribbon microphone choices. And as I make one of these, what I can do is to hover over this diagram, which will allow us to see the proximity of our virtual microphone to the speaker. Now, this makes a massive difference to the sound that we're actually going to be working with. And if I ask Maris to play a bit more, I'm going to move this microphone around and we'll hear the tone changes that come from that. Thank you very much. OK, so what we've now got is a chance to hear some of that in action. And of course, this is what happens when you put microphones in front of amps. There's a huge difference that comes in tone and volume from moving microphones around. So even if you're intending to use this stage of our master to class to go away and think about actually working with amps, think really carefully about microphone choices in particular. Combining different mics and putting them at different distances can give you really, really custom boutique sounds. But as you can see, we can also do that completely in the virtual world as well. Now, for this particular project, I've got something a little bit more driven in mind. So I'm going to come down to the distorted um, uh, options here. And I think that might mean we need to make a little bit of a volume adjustment, because I don't want to blow you all away. This is the uh, amp solution that I think we're going to work with today. Marius, let's have a bit of this. <laughs> You might be wondering why I would ask you, why not? OK, so what we're going to do is to jump in here for the bridge, and we're going to go through the chorus. Maris and I have been talking about the part I'd like him to record. But in addition to just putting this part down, what we're also going to do is to look at another feature of Logic as we do that. I've deliberately gone into cycle uh, mode here because I want to go into cycle record mode. What this basically means is that when I press record in a moment, we begin to put this guitar part down. What's going to happen is that Maris is going to get his four beat count in. And then we're going to come all the way through to the end of the chorus. And at that point, Logic's going to jump back to the top of the bridge again. It's going to allow him to go over a second pass. OK? So I'm going to come back into record mode this time. There's Marius. 
making a nice uh, noise for us. And what we're going to do now is to put this down and we'll see where we're at. I'm going to make this nice and big so you can see it clearly as we go down. Let's make sure it's really filling the screen for you, OK? And Marius, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Great. OK, so without actually starting to think about editing and doing uh, various things that we might want to do with this guitar, instead what I'm going to do straight away is to duplicate this track. Now, what that means is that without me having to reconfigure the audio inputs for it, straight away I've got exactly the same amp solution sitting on another track here altogether. So what I'm going to do is to mute the original part. Maris and I have also got an idea for a part that might work quite nicely through the chorus. So this time I'm going to stay in cycle record mode, but this time we're just going to focus on this part of the song. Without further ado, I'm going to punch him back into record mode. We've got exactly the same settings that we had before. You'll get one bar into the top of the chorus, and if you could play that twice for me again, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marius. Let's take you out of record mode, and we'll let you go and have a drink. Thanks very much, Marius. OK, so let's just reverse that for a moment. Let's mute the new chorus guitar part and go back to this sort of chugging eighth note sequence that I asked Marius to chord through the bridge and into the chorus. And let's put a loop around this so we can focus on this part really carefully. Now, cycle record mode's incredibly useful um, when You've, you're working with a musician who wants to have a few passes at something. It's all well and good for us to press record, as we did with Tom, and just say, right, get it right, please. But music isn't really like that. What we want to do sometimes is go into a loop mode and actually record a number of takes so that we can then begin to think about choosing our favorite bits. And it's also true that sometimes we aren't just producers, but players as well. I might set up my guitar over here, I might press record, and I might want to wander over there, make some recordings without having to constantly go backwards and forwards between two separate places. So that's one reason why cycle record might be useful. But it's also fair to say that there's an, I've got a slightly hidden agenda here, which is that what I really want to do with Marius's guitar parts is to use both of them. Rather than one or the other, I want to be in a position where I can use both parts, make them nice and stereo, really wide, and have loads of power as a result. And I can do that if I've worked in cycle record mode, because up here at the top, within this region, you can see this little number two. And what that's showing me is that we've got two separate passes within this region. Now, if I click on that number, one of the options that's available to me is either I can select one take or the other up here. But what I want to do is to unpack this performance to new tracks. And what that does is to bring both of the guitar parts that Marius recorded into my arrangement. Here's the first one, and here's the other one. So now we've got both of them sitting there waiting, ready for me to go to town on uh, how I might choose to set these up with effects. Now, again, just to make things easy, I'm going to mute the second part, so we're just focusing on this one for now. And the reason that I want to do that is because, as well as the amp solution that we set up for Marius's guitar, I also want to configure a pedal solution. 
You'll see when you go and see guitarists playing live or in the studio that as well as amps and microphones to record those amps, they'll usually be surrounded by boxes on, uh, on the floor which they'll stomp on, which will provide additional tone. And there are pedals for all kinds of things for guitarists. Chorus pedals, drive pedals, overdrive pedals, delays, you name it. And what we can do within Logic is to configure a pedal solution as well as an amp solution. Now what I want to do is to put uh, a collection of pedals together between my gain dial and my amp. So what I've done is I've just hovered in this little gap. You see a little white line between those two plugins. And if I click there, what I can do is to come back into amps and pedals. And this time I'm going to select pedal board. And that moves the amp down. If I push this gently to one side, you can see that now this new plugin has been added between the two previous ones. And in fact, let's just bypass the amp so we can clearly hear what we're going to be doing within pedal board. Over here, I've got a whole collection of pedals that I can put together in a line in order to further enhance this particular sound. And the first one I'm going to drag in is Vintage Drive. I really like this. It's going to give me a little bit of extra warmth. We can adjust the tone. We can crank up the drive level. We can crank up the overall level as well and just hear how this sounds on this guitar part. It's worth remembering, this, by the way, is what Marius recorded. This is the sound of his original guitar. Here it is with drive. And here it is with drive going into the amp. Okay, that's working nicely. What I also want to do is to bring in my favorite pedal from Pedal Ball, which is actually Delay. Might sound like a really unsexy choice, but the reason I particularly like this pedal is because I can actually create reversed delays here. So delays that don't just produce regular echoes, but these slightly weird and wonderful, slightly psychedelic effects. So I'm gonna turn that into reverse mode. I also want to synchronize the delay time so that it's in time with the track. And I'm gonna go with eighth notes, I think, to start with. Feedback controls how many repeats of each echo I get. And the mix dial overall, well, we've seen that in the compressor, that said it's the blend between the unprocessed sound and the super processed sound, i.e. just delay. Let's set a balance here somewhere. I can also dial in some dirt, and this is pitch flutter as well. Let's just hear those two pedals without the amp. Okay, so you can hear those delays really clearly. And let's punch that back in with the amplifier as well. And now we've got our guitar tone. Okay, so what I want to do is to apply this sound to both sides, or I'm about to make these stereo, so both performances that Marius created for us. So what I'm gonna do is just to make uh, we'll close down our little region expector here because we don't need that right now. And what I'm going to do instead is to come into the settings menu and I'm going to copy this channel strip setting. And what that's going to do is to take all those choices just made in terms of uh, plugins and the um, specific parameters for them. I can then unmute this channel and what I'm going to do in, in here is to paste it. And that will introduce pedal board here. And now it's very easy for me just to pan this one a little bit across to the right and this one across to the left. And we should hear, when we put these two parts in together, an enormous amount of power coming from the eighth guitar. OK, so straight away, we've got all this extra drive. Now, as it uh, may not surprise you to learn, what I want to do is to have kind of grouped control over these two sounds. So what I'm going to do, again, is to create a track stack. This time, I'm gonna go for another summing stack, but we're gonna just make this nice and quick. I'm gonna just call this eighths guitar, and that gives me control over those two. Now remember, I've just copied the channel strip setting, so very quickly I can repeat all of what I've just done for the chorus guitar. Go to unmute it. Let's just come out of solo mode altogether. I'm going to select my two individual takes. I'm gonna unpack those to new tracks. I'm gonna select the first of those, and I'm gonna paste my channel strip setting. I'm gonna select the second one, and I'm gonna paste the channel strip setting here as well. Then what I'm gonna do is to make these ultra wide, as wide as they can be. And then I'm going to select both of them again, 
and again create a new track stack. Now you might be wondering why are you creating two separate track stacks for the guitar parts? Well, I want individual volume control over them. So this one is going to be the chorus guitar and the other one is providing us with the eighth guitar. So what we're gonna do is run through the project from a little earlier on and we'll introduce these and we'll um, set volumes for them as well, which feel like they should work quite nicely. Okay, we're getting all that really nice raspy tone now providing a sort of accompaniment to Tom's crash cymbal at the very end of the project as well. So of course, these are settings I might tweak later on, but for now, what we've done is to add an enormous amount of power. You remember what the DI guitar sounded like, and now we've got this really nice custom solution which we've built specifically for the project. So again, there are things that we can learn and summarize as far as the uh, project is concerned for uh, guitars. So let's have a look at that now. So this time, we haven't got multiple feeds coming into our audio interfaces. We're working with just one channel. Now, I think I might even have forgotten to say at the very beginning of the project that the whole way through this, we're working at 96 kilohertz and 24 bit. Now that's ultra high resolution, okay? All into one MacBook Pro. And the guitar is the latest channel to be recorded at that resolution. And as we can see, it's coming into one channel and it's then being sent on to the computer. So as far as guitar recording is concerned, the first thing we did was to recognize that we don't necessarily need to work with amps. We can configure all of that directly through Amp Designer and Pedal Board, and they're providing the guitar tone now that we've got across four separate tracks. What I did, having configured one track, was to duplicate that, which automatically brings over the Amp Designer settings, and it allows me very quickly to not keep Marius waiting when I'm configuring a, a sort of recording solution for him to add his parts to. So duplicating tracks is great when you've got plugins already set up. Then what we did was to explore cycle record. This idea that if we go into loop mode and we hit record, what we can do is to create take folders, multiple takes, which we can then use and unpack to um, individual single tracks in the way that we have. And in fact, I've just made exactly that point. We've uh, put these together, we've created track stacks for them as well, and we've maximized the fact that we've got two takes in each of those recordings. So that brings us to the end of the first half. So far, we've taken a really basic skeletal arrangement. We've made a few little MIDI edits to it, and we've added drums and guitars. And after a little 20 minute break, I think Mike said it was gonna be 20 minutes. Yes, 20 minutes. We're going to come back and we're going to add some vocals to this project as well. So I'll see you in a bit. Thanks.